Now this is um, this is my streaming ring. So I, I'm I'm here in my office for eight hours a day minimum. Right. I'm streaming yeah. eight to three, and then I have usually you know these kinds of things afterwards, like a Zoom or phone calls, emails, that kind of thing. So. So Got to be you cozy. Have perf- you have the perfect lighting for just all day long, no matter what's going on. <laughs> Absolutely. How you doing, Mark? I'm good. How you doing, Jordan? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I've watched your new movie, Work It. And some of the, the like some of the things that she feels like she's missing in her life will will turn that into something else, and and um, you know that's that's kind of how this ragtag team of dancers comes <laughs> together, and then and then you meet Mike. <laughs> it's it's kind of that. Uh, Jake is this, you know. He's a good guy. I think he he starts off pretty pretty harsh and kind of cold to begin with because you know he's he's torn up. He he misses the life of training and dancing and performing, and that was taken away from him. And, and um, you know now he's teaching dance at like a kids dance studio and and um, you know missing that thing that he he right. worked so hard to get. And then he helps Quinn and 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 the rest of these dancers you know, build themselves into an actually really great dance team. And Quinn, obviously at the beginning, she doesn't know how to dance. At all. Was there, was there ever a time that you didn't know how to dance, that you didn't know how to sing, that you didn't know how to act? I yeah. feel like, <laughs> yeah. when? <laughs> yeah, funny enough, you can actually ask anybody that was in my life before the age of 10, including my parents. I apparently was tone deaf. I couldn't carry a note to save my life. I always thought that I sounded really? the same. Yeah, no, I, I I always thought that I was uh, that that I was fine. You know, I'd be singing Whitney Houston in the car and and jamming out and doing the thing. And and uh, apparently, it did not sound the way that I heard it until one. So day. so one day, what happened when you were ten? Your voice cracked. One day, I woke up <laughs> and I could sing. Apparently, and again, this is like I, again, it, it not it sounded the same to me. But according to my parents, according to my friends, you know, that grew up with me. They're like, no, it. That's what happened. Like one day, all of a sudden, you could sing. So I don't know. Wow. I don't really know how that how that worked out. I, I I had a love for music from a young age. I had a love for dance and just art in general, film, television. I didn't know that I wanted to pursue it. Gymnastics was my thing. That, I, that was that mm-hmm. was what I was working really hard to do was to eventually you know make the U.S. team and really the Olympic route. Yeah, that was that was it. That was all I knew. I'd go to wake up, go to school go straight from school to the gym. I do homework on the way, train, and then on the way home from from the gym after, you know, four hours, five hours in the gym, I I do more homework, wake up early the next morning, finish the homework, go back to school, rinse and repeat. So that was my that was my life. What happened? I joined the drama club because there was a girl in fifth grade that I had a crush on. So that was wow. it. <laughs> Mom I didn't raise no fool. So uh, fifth grade, you're like, mom, I'm in love. I'm, I'm forgetting uh, about gymnastics. And then I told her, <laughs> I, I, I told my folks, I was like, hey, I got a solo in this musical that we're doing at school. And they were like, oh, <laughs> oh, OK, <laughs> well, <laughs> that goes, you know, and the way that the story goes, according to them, I, I, I left the room and they were like, if he has a solo, what do the rest of these can sound like? And, and uh, it was Schoolhouse Rock. I sang Conjunction Junction. And one thing led from another. One one thing led to another. It was uh, January of my fifth grade year through December of that same year. So going into my sixth grade year, I did my first school play. I did my first community theater show, regional theater show, joined a professional theater company, and then joined the year-round conservatory program that they had. And I got bit by the bug really hard, very quickly, and fell in love. Now, now, now is this... This girl you were in love with, is this the one who's going to be your wife? No, it's not. No. No, so I, met, I did meet Ellie uh, at that same theater conservatory, like the year-round program. Um, but that was a few years later. That was I, I was 13 when we met. Oh, you were, th- oh, you were yeah. an older man. Yeah, I was, I was an older man. You know, I needed to, uh, you know, but it, but it was funny because we, you know, we, we grew up friends. That was it. You know, she was right. a few years younger than me and, and, you know, 13 and nine like that's such a massive age gap at that time. So she was like a little yeah. sister to me, you know, growing wow. up. And then, you know, we, we re-met as adults and I was like, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> hi. And thankfully she agreed to date me and then eventually agreed to become my wife. So, And are you, you really planning a wedding this month? It, no, no. Okay. So it actually got moved, unfortunately, <laughs> due to I thought, so, the, I, when I saw that I was doing my research, I'm like, yeah, man, really getting married. This no month? trips, no, no trips uh, to Hawaii in July. Unfortunately, it's, it is interesting though, because we'd, I'd, we'd be days away. It's odd. It's odd wow. to think about. Yeah. I, uh, 
would have completely finished my run on on uh, Evan Hansen and moved into a right. film that I'm, I'm producing and and then straight into straight into uh, you know these final days of wedding prep wow and COVID obviously you know moved things, Change things. COVID had different plans she had different plans when you joined the drama club was it just like this is what I want to do or was it a uh, gradual thing yes and no I'd say you know you, you get bit by the bug and any theater kid will tell you that you know all of a sudden that's like the thing that you want most right is to find more opportunities to learn and develop and hone your craft and ultimately perform for people. And so it was, it was pretty easy to tell. I mean, obviously hindsight's 2020. I think that looking back on it now, the performance aspect of gymnastics was the thing that I was really drawn to. It was the working really hard at my craft, um, figuring out how to get good, figuring out how to be better and setting my own records and, and goals for myself. And then, you know, like the meat comes and it's it, all those years and those just painstaking hours of blood and sweat and tears comes down to that one, you know, 45 seconds, a minute and a half moment of doing the routine and getting judged on it. And um, there was a real performance aspect yeah. of gymnastics to me there. And, and obviously I'm thinking more so about that now, you know, so many years later. And mm. I think that that was it was new to me, right? Mm -hmm. Art was something that I loved, but didn't necessarily know that I could do it, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, getting, putting myself in a position where, you know, I could practice these things and, and, and ultimately have, ultimately have created something with a bunch of other people and it bring joy to people. That was the thing that really became more of a drug to me than mm -hmm. I anticipated it doing. And then, you know, I joined this, this, this theater company, Red Mountain Theater Company in Birmingham, Alabama. It's an amazing company. Um, there's so much talent that comes out of there. I mean, we, we probably have like six alumni on Broadway, seven, six, seven, eight alumni on Broadway and on national tours and, you know, working in film and music and all of these things now. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of great talent that comes out of there. And it's the training that comes out of Red Mountain Theater Company. And um, yeah. it, it was amazing. But and you, you were in Dear Evan Hansen. Mm -hmm. What's it like leaving that day where they're like, we're closing up the theater right now? Like, it what was, do you do? Did you was, really? Did, we had no clue that that Wednesday night show was our last show. You know, woke okay. up the next morning. It was a very normal Thursday morning. I I'd stream in the morning. And then um, Thursdays, I, that's my, my session with my vocal coach. So I, I had lunch, got ready. You know, Ellie's at work. Um, Took my dog to the daycare. I got, you know, dressed. I was about to hop in the car and head to, uh, head to Liz's studio, my, my vocal coach. And and I got a text in a in a text thread that I have with with my castmates. And it was literally just the Playbill article that was tweeted out that effective today. Broadway shut down at 5 p.m. So that very quickly went from, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to my vocal session. I'm going to figure out what's going on. That was a Thursday afternoon. Right. You know, 15 minutes later, I think I was on a conference call with the entirety of the Evan Hansen production company. So this is all of the casts. This is all everybody that works for the show uh, from the national tour to Broadway to the West End. And um, it, it was a bit of a town hall Q&A. What does this mean? How long are we looking at this? Uh, of course, initially it was just a month. And um, those of us that are based in New York full time. You know, our first question was, can we and should we go home for this right. period of time? And our EP said, yeah, like this is the time to, to go if you can. So I was on a flight that Saturday. Um, wow. And then I, yeah, full time streaming schedule started on Sunday and I've been here since. So. It has to be, I mean, I don't know if surreal is the right word, but you don't get to say goodbye to your cast. I mean, this is your fit, you know, this is the tight family that yeah. you're with every night. Right. And you just have to be like, okay. Yeah. We're all in the same boat, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it, it definitely sucked. It was, it happened so quickly, but, um, you know, to think, the, the unknown is the hardest part, I think for any of us, especially that, you know, I guess rely on the comfort of knowing exactly where we're going and what we're doing every day of the week, mm. you know? Um, 
I think it was the unknown that was so uncomfortable for everybody and, and still is really. The thing that weighs heaviest on my heart, honestly, is just, um, I think specifically the people in the industry, even more specifically in New York City, where Broadway, Broadway's it. This is what, this is what I do. This is my day. This is my nine to five. You know, I, I wake up, I have my day. I'm working on other things sometimes. And then I'm going and doing the show in the evening. You know, we go clock in and do the show and then go home and rinse and repeat, you know, and that's eight times a week. And when I'm not working on my show, I'm working on a TV series or I'm working, I'm, you know, maybe one of the makeup artists freelances and is, you know, a part of a, a series or, right. you know, an art gallery, whatever the case may be, all of it shut down. You know? So that's the thing that I think weighed heaviest on my heart, especially for, for the people that are in this beautiful community that have families, you know, yeah. there's a, there's a single mother in my cast and that it's devastating, you know? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, hopefully we will come out of it, like you said, stronger and yeah. more resilient. And it's going to be one of those things. If we could survive this, it's going to make us pretty tough, I hope. I, I completely agree. It's funny because I'm, I'm producing a handful of movies over the course of the next couple of years. And that's that's a brand new side of my life. And my world is, is getting my production company up and running and built up. And and um, thankfully, you know, I've, I've got some things that are already like on the ground and running and right. are being developed and we have timelines for things and we're planning around how to film during COVID and talking to film right. insurance companies and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, man, but it's almost like learning how to produce during COVID is like learning how to drive in LA. It's like, if you could drive in LA, you can pretty <laughs> much drive anywhere. I'm like, I, no, I can really... produce a film during this time. So singer, dancer actor producer streamer who do you look who's your inspiration who do you look to saying that person's on my vision board donald glover yeah donald glover well, yeah he's he's doing it he's yeah, why he, why why is he the one who's doing it for you and just i mean everything he, he has the hand of midas everything he puts his hands right. on just turns to gold and it's genuine it's real he yeah, i have a handful of Friends that have worked with him, and they all say the same thing about him. They talk about how, a how kind he is, how uh, respected he is in the industry because of his kindness and his work ethic. Mm-hmm. It's it's really incredible. I mean, he's constantly moving and shaking, and and you know, so loved in the music industry, so loved in the film industry. Writers and producers love him for his work he did on Community in Atlanta and right. as an actor. He just, he takes advantage of all of the, the moments, you know, he's got dynamic and range for days and, and, um, he's a black man. He's doing Tell it and he's, 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 he's talk, so loved and so respected and happens to also be black. Talk about that because, you know, there was a time when men like you didn't have people yeah. like Donald Glover's to look up to. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, just that. Yeah. Just that. It's, yeah. I mean. I, I think that we've come a long way, but God, do we have a long way to go still? Yeah. You know, I think the people like Lynn Manuel Miranda and, and Donald Glover and, and I mean, we could go down a list of incredible taste and change makers in our industry that, you know, happen to be people of color mm. that are so loved and their work is so loved. Um, I think that it's 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 the lack of opportunity to showcase these things that we really still need to have our eyes and ears on. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually talk about this often. I, I don't know that I've actually spoken to any outlet or anything about it, but you know, on Twitch, for example, all of the top top streamers on Twitch are white men. You know, mm-hmm. and and I quite, I'm like, what? Well, how is that really a thing? You know what I mean? Like what? How does how does that work its way there? Because there are plenty. I mean, it's a it's a very diverse space, and the mm. gaming industry itself is remarkably diverse as well. It's just the, there's just a lack of spotlights that are shed on creators that are people of color. Um, that maybe it's overlooked. Maybe people aren't necessarily thinking about it. They're just like, oh, this guy's popular. You know, let's let's feature him on the front page. Let's you know, but it's it's people are you know people have you know they're not. They have that unconscious, mm-hmm. 
racism in the sense of like, that's the white guy. Right. Yeah. You put yeah. the white guy on the page. Um, yeah, and, and I think that like, I, and I could talk about this all day, right? right. Especially over the course of the last couple of months. I mean, like I've had right. conversations ad nauseum with uh, uh, people that are in my personal life and my work life, you know, my community on Twitch, et cetera, et cetera. I think that ultimately at the end of the day, still black voices are the most inspirational, but also white voices are still the most powerful. <laughs> and there's, right. there's, there's not a lot of change that can happen until the white voices go, huh, yeah. I mean, maybe, <laughs> what if we did this, you know, and, and, and well, test, tested the waters. Well, what's great, I mean, taking you back to Work It, you look at yeah. Work It, that diversity uh, in the cast, you look at so many of these Netflix, especially in the streaming world, but I keep saying my thing is, it's a, it's gonna be a generational shift. Yeah, absolutely. It's not gonna happen overnight. You can't. What? And, and, and it's going to feel very, it's going to feel very inorganic to consumers as well. Right. I mean, like right. any, any move that is made by any big studio or network at the moment that flexes and leans towards, you know, the world of color, mm. it to consumers seems like there's an agenda. And if there is, right. then screw it, you know, because right. the agenda should be inclusivity and diversity. <laughs> That's, it should that's, be an, that even should, an agenda. It should yeah. just be. But even if it, like, even if it, we need to call it an agenda, <laughs> then agenda. sure, it's an agenda. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like, diversity. I got the, I, I got sent the poster from the head of my social media team. She sent me the poster for work yesterday, and it literally made me shed a tear. I looked oh, on, I looked great. at it, and of the nine odd people that are on there, two of them are 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 white. And I'm not saying like take the jobs away from the white people. <laughs> I mean, I'm white as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I just, I love to see the way that America is shaped now. Which is why right. I love shows like Hamilton, for example. You go and you, you see Hamilton and these uh, seemingly mythological creatures, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Addis, blah, 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 blah. They're all played by people that look the way that America looks today, you know? Right. And it's just what it is. It's not that it's not talked about. It's not, you know, right. whatever. It just, it is what it is. And I think that that takes time, first of all. And it and it's fine that it does. Because again, we have come a long way, but we still do have a long way to go. And mm -hmm. taking these steps or, you know, it's it's the only way where there's a world where my kids and my grandkids will, will it won't even be a, a thought process. It won't be a conversation that's had because you're a human and I'm a human right. and we're all humans, you know? <laughs> so- has it even changed in that time that you're been in the business? Like, do you have you seen yourself up for roles that when you even first started out, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened? Yeah, yeah, I think that it has. Um, I think that it has in some minor ways for sure. I mm -hmm. when I, when I first got started, I mean, we're we're talking sixteen years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of blended families for somebody like myself, who is multi-ethnic, I'm, I'm all sorts of different things. I'm white, I'm black, I'm Italian, I'm Greek, I'm Pacific Islander, I'm Asian, I'm all sorts of things. You know, the idea of blending a family, you know, let there be a white mom and a black dad or vice versa. It just wasn't normal. You know, it just, no. it, it's, it's still, I mean, even though we can talk about all sorts of families that are, you know, beautiful all over the world, not just America, that that are of all of these different, you know, ethnic backgrounds, et cetera, that representation on screen just rarely existed, if yeah. it did at all. And uh, I have seen more of that. I still mm -hmm. to this day, actually just just last year, I there I was in talks for a pretty big role for a pretty big film from a pretty big studio and had had friends at the I think he I think he's trying to tell me that he's not going to tell me what it is. Oh, well, I'm not going to say what it is. I'm definitely not going to say what it is. No, I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm not I'm not here to harm anybody, but I I was I was told, you know, ears on the ground there that because they already had their ethnic lead and it was a different color from the original character they for lack of a better term needed more 
I guess, inclusivity, you know? Right. I, I'm either not black enough or I'm not white enough. Right. And that's the, that's the thing, mm. like, I still get today that irks me. Obviously, I am who I am, born the way that I am, you know? Um, I could say, like, listen, I'll tan, but... <laughs> What's the, what's, could you, could what's you the, imagine? What's the point? You know, what's the point? Um, yeah. So yeah it, it definitely, it definitely still is a thing, mm. you know, and I think um, is becoming less and less frequent. I think that because the voices are so loud right now, and as the conversation continues to flow just within our social culture, um, we'll continue to see more change. What, it, what does it feel like to get? you know, a uh, tweet or uh, Instagram or or message anywhere from a kid who says, you look like me. There's nothing like it. Yeah. Chris Jackson, who played the original Benny and in the Heights, played the original mm-hmm. George Washington and Hamilton. Yep. I was a huge fan of his. I was 13 years old. And uh, we had a mutual friend that I didn't know was a mutual friend who got him to call me because he knew that I was a fan. Uh, well, she knew that I was a fan, got Chris to call me. We talked for an hour about life and art, and family and friends, and blah, blah, blah. I was, still, I was a kid in Birmingham, Alabama. I just started making my first trips to L.A., you know. What? But there was That's a guy crazy. that was working on Broadway in a show that I loved that was mixed. He was doing it, you know. Corbin Blue, who became a very good friend of mine. Yeah. High School Musical. Dude looks like me. He's doing it. <laughs> He's like up there and doing the thing and we could be brothers. That's awesome. You know, and I told both of these guys this thing. And, and of course, like now they're both very good friends because um, the industry is this big, as you know. Right. You eventually just meet people and work with people and so on and so forth. But at the end of that conversation, I mean, when I, I was telling Chris, you know, what an inspiration he was to me and still is, you know, still love him to death. We actually were having a whiskey date next week. We sit down and... <laughs> chat over FaceTime and, and catch up. But, um, you know, I told him, I, right, like when we, first, when we first met over the phone, I was like, I, I admire you so much for all these different reasons, but one of the things that I love most about you is something that you're not even responsible for. It's, it's that you look like me and you represent those of us that didn't know that we could actually do what you're doing and you're doing it at the highest level. And... Mm. That means the world. And then he said, we ended that conversation with, I can't wait to work with you one day. And then we did Hamilton years later. Well, Jordan, thank you so much. This is great. Thank you for having me.